Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Tim Ball. Dr. Tim Ball is a climatologist who has been teaching and educating people for 40 years in climatology. He has been a professor. He's written thousands of articles. And one of the interesting things about Dr. Tim Ball is that he is interested in the context in which climate happens. He's also studied crop production, the survival of animals in the wild and animals in general. And we have had him on many times, actually. We did a piece with him on the complexity of ocean exploration, examining peer review with best-selling author Gavin Menzies, author of 1421 and 1434. Our first climate show called A True Inquiry into Climate and Weather with Robert Felix and Joe Dalio. And we have done other shows with him. But today I've invited him on because I have a concern, like many of you, about the glaciers melting. And while we've had geologists and climatologists and meteorologists and people from every area of climatology on, I started to read some articles on this and I got very nervous. And I invited Dr. Tim Ball to help set the record for this, how we can understand glacier melting in context. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Tim Ball back to its rainmaking time. Good afternoon. Well, thank you, Kim, and thanks for the opportunity. The first thing is that many of us who love the Earth and are concerned about our planet keep seeing these articles on the Internet and on YouTube. And the thing that concerns me is somehow I came in touch with this site, cc.rsoe.hu slash index. I'm going to leave a link up after we get the show to the public. But several of the articles were the following. Extreme weather and climate change, leaking Siberian ice prompts methane warning, Austrian glaciers shrink, and melting Arctic ice threatens a quarter of the world's population. Now, when you click into these on this site, and they're different sources like RIA, Novosti, Planet Ski, AP, LA Times, and TVN, like Nancy, Z.co.nz, what you get are videos of rivers, of streams, of the sun being out, and people talking. For me, it seems all very convincing. If I hadn't done a year and a half of due diligence about climate, now I'm not saying it makes me a climatologist, I'm not saying I'm fit to be in the conversation at the highest level, but I do have a frame of reference now that I didn't have when I was a global warming advocate or believer, if you will, a year and a half ago. So I would like you to give us the frame of reference for how we evaluate whether what we're being told about the melting Arctic ice or the Australian glaciers shrinking, how do we deal with this? How do we know if it's true or not? Okay, very, very good questions. And, and it speaks to uh, what is being exploited here. Uh, the first thing is people's fear. Um, that's embodied in the uh, the lovely story about Chicken Little. The sky is falling, and um, and of course uh, then you have on each side the uh, Cassandras. That is the doom and gloom, and then you have the Pollyanna people. And what we're what we're trying to do, and what you're what you're asking about, is how can I come down somewhere sensibly in the middle? Because we know there are. Uh, events that occurred, catastrophic events, and we also know that there, there are some very positive things, but there's a tendency to only focus on one side of it. And so the articles that you mention in that website um, are actually focusing on the, the doom and gloom, the Cassandra, and so on. And um, the, so that, that fear factor is the first thing that's being exploited. The second thing that's being exploited is people's lack of understanding. And it's not just understanding uh, about um, uh, the, the science, but it's also lack of uh, knowledge or understanding about the planet. Um, and, um, you know, a Canadian prime minister once said Canada's problem is too much geography and not, not enough history. <laughs> and I think that that applies to the world. But I think it's wrong in that we've got lots of geography and lots of history. The problem is people know very little about either one. And, um, and I noticed a story today out of England where students, um, this severe criticism of um, the teaching of geography in their high school curriculum. 
And uh, so uh, th this, uh, and they, they say, oh, we're because they're not being taught where different places are in the world, you know, the old standard, you've got to learn a few facts before you can start debating them. So the lack of understanding, and the more obscure, but potentially threatening something is, the more they can play on it. Now, the reason I'm making those comments, Kim, is because um, when I say to people, uh, well, what's wrong with global warming? Because all you hear are the negative sides. In other words, the Cassandras have the platform, and um, there are a, a lot of positive things for uh, global warming. And one of the, the, perhaps the most uh, nasty attacks I got uh, were about an article I wrote uh, for Canadian consumption about the benefits of warming for Canada, and uh, you, they didn't want to hear that. Now. It's partly fueled by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which we've talked about. They say warming is proven and it's going to continue. And then they look at all the negative impacts of it. They don't look at, well, what are the positive things? So we need less heat energy to heat our homes. We need less fuel because our cars are not idling and, and on and on and on. Um, and, and so you're only hearing one side of the story. But when, as I said, when I ask, so when I ask people what's wrong with warming, um, they can't they can't think uh, of it. They can't respond to it. And then after a couple of minutes, they come out and say, "Oh well, the sea level is going to rise," and that because that has become uh, the sort of standard response. Well, how, why is the sea level going to rise? Oh well, those glaciers are going to melt, and that's why in Al Gore's movie. He made such a big part of his movie about the melting glaciers and about the sea level rise and, um, and then the computer images of the lowlands, uh, the Calcutta, the Delta of the Ganges, uh, Florida being inundated with water and so on. And those images, of course, are, are, are frightening to people. Very frightening. Well, of course, you can joke about it. You can say, well, you know, uh, New York's going underwater, and, and, and uh, you can see that as urban renewal. Um, but it's, um, you know, I mean, to, to, you know, to step aside from the flippant for a minute, um, it is frightening to people, and it's partly frightening because, and again, most don't know this, but they intuitively sense this, people tend to live in floodplains, in flat areas, uh, particularly along the ocean's edges, if you take the Ganges Delta, the Nile Delta, the Great Deltas, uh, or the the, uh, the lowlands of Europe, e even in the U.S., the Mississippi area. And it's because those are areas where the soils are fertile, they can produce the food they need, but they're also high-risk areas because of flooding. And when you list the um, the climate disasters of the 20th century, the top 20 of them, 11 of them are uh, uh, droughts, but five of them are flooding. So 16 of the 20 are related to this problem of too much water or not enough water. And the flooding one, of course, is, is, um, is, is a big threat. So that's why um, it's become such an issue. But of course, it all goes back to the glaciers and the ice and, and as I said, people's uh, lack of understanding. Now, just to, just to illustrate the point, and we'll get into the, 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 the dynamics of ice and glaciers and so on, sea level has been rising for the last 10,000 years. And it's risen very dramatically because uh, about 15,000 years ago, sea level was 500 feet lower than it is today. And, and imagine that, it, it, you know, it, looking at the world, just lower the sea levels by 500 feet. And what does that do to the, uh, the English Channel, the Baltic, uh, and, and all around the world? You can think of the change to the land-water ratios that that would have. So the sea level has, has risen. The English Channel wasn't there 6,000 years ago. And in fact, the archaeologists find some of their best sites of, of ancient Britain out under the North Sea, which have been inundated. And, and so uh, the sea level has been rising, ironically, the, the rate of sea level rise has reduced in the last thousand years and has reduced even more in the last 200 years. So the rate is decreasing. Now, why, is, why has this happened? Well, 20,000 years ago, there were massive ice sheets on the land. North America, uh, almost a, a third of the continent was covered with an ice sheet larger in area than the current Antarctic ice sheet. And that ice is formed from water that's come from the oceans. 
And so when the ice forms on the land, the oceans are lowered. Of course, then conversely, when the ice melts on the land, it goes back into the oceans and the sea levels rise. And that's what's been happening uh, since the end of the last ice age that began approximately 15 to 18,000 years ago. And so, and, and by the way, in Gore's movie, the claim that he made about how much sea level was going to rise in the future because of global warming, uh, and w of course the argument then is the warming will cause an increase of melt of the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets. Um, he was even in disagreement, dramatic disagreement, with his fellow uh, Nobel Prize winners because the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, had a, a dis dramatically lower rate of increase of sea level compared to his. So it, 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 it's, that's just further illustration of, of Gore's sensationalism. But even what the IPCC are doing is, is based on a single assumption and then projecting uh, forward a single idea that the world is going to warm up. I want to go back to this melting Arctic ice. One of the sentences that they wrote is, melting Arctic ice affects the climate of the entire planet. Global warming has already driven polar bears to cannibalism and may threaten the lives of a quarter of the world's population by 2100. That's heavy stuff. Well, it, it, and of course, it's, it's got all of the good stuff in there. You know, that it's an area that nobody knows anything about, the Arctic. It's got the, um, it affecting the whole globe from this one area. And it's got um, these nice um, creatures, the polar bears with the nice round eyes and white fur. And, uh, oh, and it's got all of the nasty things about cannibalism. And the problem is none of it is true. Um, I've worked with uh, with one of the uh, top experts on polar bears. In, in, uh, he, he lives in Iglulik. Is that Mitch? Yes. And and I've I've known him for 30 years. And, and we've, we've, we've written articles that... Uh, uh, Mr. Dick, uh, I think it was Dave Dick, uh, we published articles on polar bears in the Hudson Bay area. So I'm very familiar with the whole polar bear story. And of course, one of the things that, um, well, we'll get onto the ice thing in a minute, but uh, one of the things about the polar bears, as with all animals on this planet, the populations fluctuate tremendously. Um, and they fluctuate, of course, with what we just finished talking about, the wet and dry cycles. And um, we did we did research all across uh, northern central and northern uh, Canada, and um, discovered that animal populations fluctuating by as much as a thousand percent. That's normal. Uh, what's what's not correct is the scientific view of animal populations. Um, it assumes that they're relatively constant over time, and it assumes that if they crash. Uh, they simply are not going to recover. And um, the, the, that's the, an unreality. I'll just give you one quick little story with, it, uh, with this. We were looking at northern Manitoba and, and uh, because they claimed the hydro dams, the electric dams, were destroying the, the aboriginal population's lifestyle and so on. Well, there was a herd of woodland caribou called the Kaminuriak herd. In 1980, uh, the populations were estimated to be about 7,000 animals. And the government even came in and said, you can't hunt them even for, even though they're your fundamental food supply, you're not going to be able to hunt them. We'll provide you with food, which they did, and they've now got diabetes, but that's another story. Well, seven years later, so 1980, 1987, seven years later, they went in and they, they, there was 155,000 caribou. Oh, my God. Right. And right away, they're saying, oh, well, well, you know, we got the numbers wrong. We counted wrong. We counted too many this time and not enough the first time and so on. And the reason they said that you couldn't hunt them was because they were down to 7,000. They were widespread. There was uh, they couldn't possibly recover. And um, the what this was based on, Kim, was in the literature, the, the academic literature. It said that these caribou calved the cows calved at three years old and they had one calf per cow what it turned out was that when the population crashed and it crashed because there was drought in the region and vegetation disappearing and then when the rains came back and the vegetation recovered the animals uh, had a catch-up factor and what happened was that the cows started calving at two years old and they started having two and three calves per cow Interesting. which of course then gives you a multiple factor to recover your population 
And, and, and when you start to look at populations, and, and, and by the way, some of the earliest records on ecology, and that word was first used um, by Charles Elton, who did studies on the relationship between the number of uh, lynx and, and wild shoe hare, like a, a rabbit, and, and he used the fur trade records and showed that the, um, the populations of these animals fluctuated uh, tremendously. Um, and then I'm just working on an article now showing that it fluctuates in conjunction with the 11-year sunspot cycle. And so uh, these ideas have been around, but they're still not part of the way people see things. They think that, oh, if a population crashes, that's the end of it. But... It's not the case. Uh, and every, both plants and animals have these catch-up factors. So when they talk about the polar bears, it's exactly the, exactly the same thing. And um, the idea about cannibalism, of course, uh, it's just sim simply a, a, a non-correct non story. There was another story put out that they were, um, you know, they were wasting away. And the reason that they were um, having, uh, they were suffering from hunger was because the, the population had exploded. There were too many animals for the region. And then when the, uh, the drought came in and, and the uh, food supply disappeared, well, of course, nature's going to kill some of them off. That's the way it works. And uh, so they, they take little bits of these stories and, of course, sensationalize them into the stories that you're reading. Can I give you one more before we start to go into the whole sure. shrinking glaciers thing? So the second article says Austrian glaciers shrink. Incidentally, this was done on my birthday this year, May 8th, 2010, source Planet Ski. It says 91% of them reduced in size last year some of them by as much as 46 meters, according to the latest figures. The Austrian Alps Society has released the statistics and makes worrying reading for environmentalists and those concerned about the mountain landscape. The sharpest decline was some of the glaciers in the Tyrol on the mountains of the, I can't even pronounce this. Oh my That's God. In Austria. It's Niger, Jofferner. That's where the yodeling comes from. Yeah, Niger, Jofferner, Kessel, Juan Ferner, and Mazel Van Ferner. God help me with my accent. All right. The society has been studying the glaciers and their size for over 100 years. One glacier did actually grow last year, but only by a few centimeters. The melting is put down to rising summer temperatures. So when you read stuff like this, and these pieces are coming in from all over the world. It's very difficult to receive this and stand in the knowledge that we don't know what we're getting for information. We're getting bits and pieces of things. So can you lay out whatever you feel sure. to be the truth about the glaciers and how they're analyzed, whether they're shrinking or growing? Bob Felix says they're growing. Other professionals say they're growing. And yet we get a lot of news saying everything is shrinking. Okay, um, and uh, well, well, just, just one one quick comment was that one of the um, false pieces of information that were deliberately put in to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report was that the Himalayan glaciers were uh, melting and, and they'd be all gone within so many years. And it turned out that that was uh, deliberately created and put into the IPCC reports. And uh, they had to come out and, uh, and apologize and say it was wrong. And so here you've got the so-called UN official agency uh, deliberately trying to, or deliberately presenting uh, incorrect information about mountain glaciers. But just one interesting little comment that I'll start out with. I'll pose you a question. Um, interesting to go back and look at um, Hannibal. And Hannibal, of course, was the uh, uh, the leader of the uh, Roman portion of, of, of the empire in North Africa. And, uh, of course, he was from Carthage, which is in North Africa, and he came over to attack Rome. And uh, he, he took elephants through the uh, Alp Alps in, in the Europe, and he took them through regions that today have glaciers in them. And uh, so if you go back to the Roman era uh, 2,000 years ago, the world was warmer than it is today. And uh, so the glaciers uh, uh, grow and retreat all of the time, and um, you can show that back through history. Um, 
And, and of course, one of the things I want to start off with, Kim, is pointing out that, well, let's, let's look at, at, at ice. First of all, ice forms in two ways. It, form, it forms either by water freezing and becoming ice, which the one is the one people are familiar with, but the glaciers form in a different, the ice in them is formed in a different way. How? It's formed by snow falling. And of course, snow is simply uh, ice crystals that have collected together. And, and there's another part of the, the mythology of, of science where there's no two snowflakes are alike. You, everybody hears that comment. And my, my comment is prove it. I mean, how can you look at even a, a <laughs> fraction of the snowflakes in one snowstorm? <laughs> you mean, go to Ohio today and say, look, all those snowflakes are, are, are uh, different. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and so it, it, it's a function of the crystallization. But anyway, what happens is that snow falls. And if the snow then can survive through the summer melt, and of course, that's part of the comment in that one article. They say, well, summer temperatures are warmer. Then if that snow survives through the summer, then next winter you get another layer of snow, and then gradually the snow layers accumulate. And what happens is that as they accumulate, the snow in them changes. It's, it's, a, it's a process called nivation, N-I-V-A-T-I-O-N. And it, it's a, another term of things that are going on is melding, M-E-L-D. Now, skiers know that you can get different types of snow. You can get the nice, soft, powdery snow, the freshly fallen snow. But when you get old snow, it's very granular. And that's because the snowflakes are starting to meld together. They're not melting together. They're actually melding together and, and, and forming into these uh, granular uh, lumps. Now, over, and, of course, then there's air between those granular lumps, and, and that's valuable, by the way, for um, uh, creatures living under the snow. Um, and uh, I worked with a guy who, who made, did a whole lot of research on snow and survival of animals under the snow. He, in fact, had a, a cabin out in the, in the northern Manitoba. They spend the winters out there. But that provides air and movement of air, but it also provides an insulation under the snow for animals that live under the snow. And, and But anyway, gradually, as the snow layers build up, then uh, they push together the heat and the weight of the over, overlying layers, gradually forms, it makes it form into ice. Okay, but you, but you, you, you need um, a, quite a depth of, of this snow for that to form into uh, solid ice. So if you go to a, a glacier, you get about the upper 150 meters of it, have these quite distinct snow layers that are becoming ice layers. And then they, they, they form a, a brittle ice, an ice that will crack. But below 150 feet, the ice is now under such heat and pressure that it, that it becomes plastic. So, and, and then it, when it's plastic, of course, it will flow just like water. The ice will flow. It's much slower, obviously, but it flows just like water will flow. And so in a glacier, as you go down through the glacier, you've got the brittle layer in the top 150 feet. And then below that, you've got the plastic layer, which is constantly moving down slope because it's, it's plastic and it will flow. Now, when that plastic layer goes over a, a rock or a cliff, it will flow and bend. But the brittle layer can't can't bend, so it cracks, and then you get what, uh, the crevasses that are formed, the cracks in the ice. But the crevasses only go down a certain depth because then you, as you get down to the bottom, you're down to the plastic layer, which is not cracking. And I used to tease the students, said, look, you know, if you're going to fall into a crevasse, uh, don't worry, you're only going to go down about 150 feet, and um, you, you'll be able to climb your way back out again. But anything that falls into those crevasses gets absorbed into the glacier, into the plastic part of the glacier, and then that will move through the ice out to the snout, which is the front of the glacier. And there's, there's one uh, quite famous story of, of a soldier, a Swiss soldier, 400 years ago, crossing the ice, fell in a crevasse, and emerged at the snout of the glacier <laughs> back in the 20th century. And, of course, again, I would tease the students and say, look, if you fall in the crevasse, just hold your breath, and sooner or later you'll come out at the front. Oh, my God. 
That's <clears throat> wild. Yeah. All right, now what does this mean to us? Well, what it means is that the snout or the front of the glacier doesn't actually um, uh, melt in, in, in a sense. Well, let me back up a bit. Um, the, the front of the glacier seems to move forward or move back. But within the glacier, the plastic ice is constantly flowing to the snout of the glacier. Okay, so so even though the, the the front of the glacier, the snout appears to be moving back up the valley, the ice is still being delivered to the front of it. That's why when you look at any mountain glacier or the Antarctic or Greenland glaciers, at the snout, it's very dirty. There's all sorts of debris, and in fact, there's an article out just recently claiming that um, this increased debris is is increasing the rate of melt at the snout of the glacier. Uh, because it's, it attracts the heat more than the white snow or ice that reflects the sunlight. And, and so I used to describe it this way to the students, still do to everybody else, that a glacier doesn't retreat, it advances to the rear. That's strange, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, so what you've got going on then is that glaciers form uh, either uh, in high ground, and you get them, by the way, even at the equator, you get glaciers in the, in the uh, uh, Andes Mountains above a certain level. Uh, so there you've got altitude is, is determining the front, of the, the front line of the glaciers and the snow line, by the way, or in terms of latitude. And, and, I, and I love the idea that if you just change the first two letters of altitude and latitude, it's the same word. And they're directly connected because as you go up the side of a mountain, you go through the uh, the forested area, and then you get to the uh, tundra, or you get to the tree line, and then the tundra, which is is Russian for treeless zone, and then you get into the um, the permanent snow line, right? And this is true as you go north, or or towards the South Pole. So as you go towards the poles, you go through exactly the same changes in um, climate and, and uh, vegetation and glaciation, the same thing. And um, so these glaciers then uh, are, take two forms. They either are formed in mountains, and they're called alpine glaciers, and that's the ones they're talking about in the Tyrol that you read out, or they are continental glaciers. That is that they, they sit over a complete landmass and the two most famous ones today are, of course, of Greenland and Antarctica. Um, but, uh, th but they both form in the same way. They form by an accumulation of snow that gradually turns to ice, and then once it uh, reaches the plastic level, it starts to flow. So, for example, in Antarctica, they keep talking about, oh, new iceberg breaking off. This is a sign of warming. No, it isn't. In fact, it's a sign that the glacier is growing because as the, the snow falls, the weight of the glacier pushes down, which squeezes out the ice around the edges out into the oceans where it breaks off and forms, uh, forms um, icebergs. So there's a science to glaciation. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. And, and in fact, the history of the Earth is that we're under glaciation far more than we're under warm periods like we are now. We, we should be grateful to be alive during an interglacial. Uh, because I got to tell you, you don't want to be around when there's a glacier. Uh, imagine North America uh, with one third of it covered with a massive ice sheet. No. No, I did an interview with Don Easterbrook a few weeks ago. And he was very concerned that we're in a cooling cycle based yep. on the sunspot activity and what's happening around the world and the food supply. Very concerned. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I agree with him. Now, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm concerned about it, but, um, you know, I mean, I, again, I joke about it. I say, because we knew where the glaciers formed. They'll form in the same places this time, and we know which way they move, so we know which way to run to get away from so them. So where do we go? <laughs> well, you, you, you head south because Florida will be bigger because the water will have come out of the oceans and, and the sea level will have dropped. So we head south, not north. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, and of course... Um, Here we come, Texas. No. <laughs> but it's, it's um, of course, one of the things that happens as the glaciers expand in the polar regions, then the one 
climate zone that disappears are the desert zones, which are within 15 to 30 degrees of the uh, equator. And the Sahara, of course, is the per classic example of it. During the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, the, uh, the Sahara Desert became uh, grassland and um, wooded, lightly wooded area, what they call now in Africa, savanna. And, of course, one of the interesting things about that was that it, that allowed people to get out of Africa across the Sahara Desert, which prior to that was a, a, a really a, a huge barrier to movement. But um, and, and by the way, those wetter regions in the desert areas, those are called pluvials from the Latin word for rain. They are now in an interpluvial, that is, they're in, in an arid uh, time period. In the polar regions, we're in an interglacial. And 20,000 years ago, which in, in, even in human terms is, is yesterday, um, we were in a glacial. And uh, so uh, what I've described for you then are um, the three different forms of ice. One is the sea ice, that is water freezing uh, to form the sea ice. The second is the um, uh, glaciers forming. Uh, into brittle ice, the upper layer of it, and then the plastic layer beneath it, which causes the glacier to flow. Now, to go back to the um, uh, Arctic ice, which was part of the original question, Arctic uh, ice is already in the ocean. The ice is formed by water from the ocean freezing. And by the way, it freezes at a different temperature than fresh water, because of the salt in it. Now, people know about that because you've got ice on your sidewalk. You throw salt on it, causes the ice to melt. So that, that uh, fresh water starts to freeze at about 2 degrees Celsius. And um, sea ice doesn't start to freeze till about minus 4 degrees Celsius. There's a full 6 degrees Celsius difference between the freezing of sea ice. But as that as the seawater freezes into sea ice, it freezes out as fresh ice. So if you were to take a chunk of, of frozen seawater, it would be fresh water. Now that, of course, is, uh, is making it, it makes it tempting for people towing ice and getting fresh water supplies and so on. Now, but a lot of people say, oh, no, I've tasted the ice by the, by the uh, ocean and it tastes salty. Well, that's because of the salt spray and, and the salt that's in, in the air uh, around the oceans. And, um, but sea ice, and that, one, by the way, was a very interesting question when the two astronomers, Wales and Diamond, were sent by the Royal Society to Churchill on Hudson Bay. Uh, one of the things they were uh, asked to do was to determine if sea ice was fresh water or salt water. And uh, it, it just simply wasn't known at that time. I think most of us would assume it would be salt water. Of course, of course. But you see, one of the things, you, you remember the term freeze-dried coffee? Yes, terrible. Well, that, <laughs> okay, that, that, what they're telling you is the process by which they're, it's another form of distillation. Like distillation is when you boil the water and you, you, you get uh, eva water evaporating off of it. If you condense that water, then it's much purer water. That's what distilled water is, right? It leaves all of the junk and the minerals behind. Uh, well, the same thing is when, when, when water freezes, um, there's a distillation process going on. The ice that's formed out of that uh, frozen water leaves behind the impurities and, and the salt. So can I bring us back for just a moment? Yeah. Okay. I want you to be able to finish what you're saying, but I want to bring us back. So yeah. how do we, the public non-climatologists, how will we ever know if the glaciers are melting or whether they're just growing and breaking off? What is distinguishing our ability to know that for a fact? Obviously, we can't rely on the press for this. No. We can't rely on the traditional press for this. It seems to be around the world because I'm looking at the RSOE, the Emergency and Disaster Information Services for Budapest, Hungary, when I'm talking to you about these articles, which also have videos, by the way. Yeah. So what do we do to actually know the distinction? There's got to be some precursors to the glaciers are growing and then building and breaking off versus they're melting. Yeah, what, of course, the, the, the first thing that you need to know is that uh, you need to look at the source of the information. 
uh, if it's from the media, um, it, it, it's almost invariably going to be sensationalist because uh, uh, journalists learn very quickly that if it isn't sensational, their editor isn't going to publish it. And, and of course, trying to fill a, a 24-hour news cycle demands increasingly bizarre stories. But let me tell you how pervasive yeah. it is. Yeah. I'm looking at a emergency and disaster information service Budapest Hungary website right. with different sources, obviously, of news, you right. know, like the AP for LA Times and Planet Ski and RIA Novosti, TVNZ.co.New Zealand. In right. other words, they gather data from different places. So it's very hard for us not to be ingesting this as the reality going on. Can you see how pervasive it is? Oh, sure. And, and, and that's the consensus argument. Look, all, all these other sites are, are, are saying this, so it must be true. But what you find is that it's all, most of it's originated from, from a single story that's been planted by somebody who has an agenda. I mean, and and, and um, one of the things that I've watched occur over the last 35 years is the media uh, monitoring certain journals like Nature or Science, looking for articles that have uh, what could be turned into a sensational argument. You can say, well, oh, it's in this scientific journal. Uh, uh, most of the time, it's a scientist speculating. And then most of the time, um, and, and this is something I've grappled with for a long time, Kim, is that when you read the article, it has all of the conditional words in it. It says, oh, it could or it may. And that's something people need to look at. How often are those conditional words in there? How is it, how often is it, well, this may happen or this could happen, not that this is happening. And then what happens is, so those are in the article and you'll find a lot more of them in the original piece. And by the way, if you go and read uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the science report, not the summary for policymakers, which of course they've made sensational because they're trying to influence policy, but you go and read what the scientists are actually saying you, you, you know, you'd be saying, what's the worry? These people are admitting they know virtually nothing. And, and um, one of the things that I've been working on is pulling out these pieces from the science report and saying, well, look, this is what they actually said. And here's how it arrived. Uh, and, and it's not for, without reason that the summary for policymakers, which is, is released to the media a few months ahead of the science report, that was set up deliberately so that the more sensationalist aspects of it would have an influence upon people and the policymakers because, of course, they're looking for more funding. And, and one of the things, that's the first thing. The second thing is when you read the headline, and you've been around in a media enough to know that the headlines have to be sensational. They have to be in the active voice. They have to grab your attention. That's what they're for. Well, they're definitely very, very fearful. There is a phenomenon I do want to talk to you about that's associated with this, and I don't want to detract from the focus of the segment, but I do want right. to say this to you. It is obvious to many people around the world that there is and appears to be extreme weather going on in different countries of the world in many, many different ways. And I know now that extreme weather has been around forever, all over the world for millions of years. But we happen to all be alive at a time where we are observing extreme weather happening in different places. And the thing is, even if there is extreme weather happening, flooding or a lot of rain in one place, a volcano erupting in Iceland and earthquakes happening here and there, it seems as if all of this is being placed inside the conversation of climate change, inside global warming as the reason. I think I read something a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember who said it, but somebody said <laughs> it's cooling around the world because of global warming. Yep. It was crazy. It's like grasping at straws. Yep. The thing is, what do you say about the extreme weather issue on its own? Well, I love the comment that I don't, I can't attribute it to anybody, but somebody said that the unusual weather is more unusual than usual. <laughs> That'd be good to find out who said that. That's funny. Yeah, it would. But um, there's a couple of things about it, Kim. One is, of course, that I've already mentioned the 24-hour sensational news cycle. The other thing is that things can go on and we're not aware of them. And it's much like if you're introduced to somebody 
it seems like every time you turn around after that, there they are. They were always there. They were just not part of your... Uh, they weren't on the radar. Yeah. Okay. And, and so now what's happening, of course, is because the climate change issue um, has become has come onto the world's radar because they want to use it to say, oh, we're causing all these problems. We've got to stop this and we've got to control you here. We've got to do that. Um, it, 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 people are saying now, you know, the media are reporting every single little storm. And if you look at um, Fox are doing it, ABC are doing it, they're all doing it. They don't have weather reports anymore. They have extreme weather. Well, it's always a hurricane. Oh, this is extreme. No, hurricanes have gone on for centuries. Can I read you this one headline? Extreme yeah. weather and climate change. Victorian towns are also going through less dramatic but still serious flooding. And there are snowstorms in the U.S. and Europe, heat waves in Russia, floods in Pakistan, China and Brazil. What does this all mean? Nobel Peace Prize recipient scientist David Caroli is the lead author on the International Panel for Climate Change and says this extreme weather is in line with scientific predictions. Mark Sanisbury spoke with David Caroli. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah, but, but of course, you see, Caroli's, Caroli is wrong. He's not a climate expert. He doesn't know the history of climate. I mean, if I, if I tell you that Charles II uh, ordered people to take a day off work and they had, that they had to go to church and they had to pray for cold winters. Why? Because the, the winters were so mild that the, that the, uh, they were afraid that the plague would come and hit them. I mean, this, this is, this is absolute nonsense. Now, why did they give him the Nobel Prize? Uh, why, does why everybody they... who talks about climate change get a Nobel Prize? I don't get well, of it. Of course, the IPCC got a Nobel Prize. Al Gore got a Nobel Prize. And he got it a week after a British court had ruled that there were nine major scientific errors in his movie and that it was a political uh, document. Uh, but the Nobel Prize Committee didn't go, go and uh, learn that. They didn't go to the Internet and find out um, what was wrong with Gore's movie. It's all political. The whole thing is political, particularly the Peace Prize. And by the way, why should the people at the IPCC, who are mostly government employees, and I paid their wages, and they get the money from the Nobel Peace Prize? I and mean, this is ridiculous. I wanted to just clarify both to you and to the audience the pervasiveness yeah. of oh. how propaganda gets built. Oh, yes. This is I, it. Yeah. This is an example of it. Yep. And very believable. And so the unsuspecting person who loves their planet, who loves animals, yeah. who loves trees and the forest and nature and mountains and lakes and the ocean, yeah. etc., yeah. can get sucked into this. Yeah, exactly. And, and by the way, just let me quickly explain why the weather seems uh, to be uh, more severe. It's not because of warming. It's because of cooling. What's been happening is that the polar regions have been cooling down. The southern hemisphere for uh, at least uh, is, have been setting record cold temperatures for at least four years. It's now having a, an, it's had an effect in the northern hemisphere for two to two and a half years. And what happens is if you think about the Earth and imagine in, in, in a three-dimensional Earth and then there, the atmosphere is basically two air masses. There's a domes of cold air over the polar regions, just like a cap of cold air. And then there in between is the warmer tropical air. And uh, as the uh, sun changes the energy coming into the earth, those polar domes either expand as it gets cooler or they shrink as it gets warmer. That happens on a seasonal basis. And so uh, you, you, you where the two meet, where the cold and warm air meet, is uh, called the polar front. It's the most dynamic part of the Earth's atmosphere. It's along that front that you get the severe storms that you're, you're having tracking through the U.S. right now. In the old days, they called them blizzards. And if you want to read about some incredible blizzards compared to what they're getting now, go and read David Ludlam's wonderful books on American weather history. And, and, uh, and so on. But what, what happens is that at, uh, the, the temperature contrast between that cold air and the warm air is what causes the severe weather. It's along that boundary that the uh, tornadoes occur and develop and these uh, severe storms, and they, they call them uh, cyclones, okay, cyclonic weather. And 
just to give you an idea, Kim, of how dramatic the temperature difference across that polar front can be, the most rapid change in temperature um, rec on record was at Spearfish, South Dakota in 1943, where the temperature dropped 27 degrees Celsius in two minutes. Oh, my God. Okay, now we know that because they had those big old drum thermometers with the ink uh, marker going along on it as the drum rotated. And during that day, the temperature rose and dropped 20 degrees Celsius three times because uh, they, were, they were in the warm air at uh, uh, plus 20. The cold air came in and it dropped to minus 7. Now, people across the northern U.S. are familiar with this these dramatic changes in temperature as this cold air comes in. And, of course, can, Americans talk about, you know, the cold air advancing from Canada. What they didn't realize was that this was part of the NAFTA agreement, that we send you cold air and you... <laughs> anyway, <but> you, <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry, I shouldn't be so... Actually, no, no, no. I, I think we yeah. should do a separate piece on the whole NAFTA agreement. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, in this polar front, and by the way, above the surface, related to it, is a very rapid flowing uh, river of air, which is uh, technically called the circumpolar vortex, but more, most people know as the jet stream. Okay, as that I was jet just stream... going to ask you about the jet stream. Yeah. I love it. Go on. Okay, well, as the jet stream flows from west to east, and it does it in both hemispheres, it meanders back and forth. It's something called sinuosity. And that's not fully understood by scientists, the concept of sinuosity. But it, it wanders back and forth. And, of course, it makes, it creates waves in the polar front. And those waves are called Rossby waves. They were discovered by an American meteorologist, Carl Rossby, back in 1946, if you can imagine. And those waves move from west to east. And as they move you go through the different patterns of weather. So you can be in the warm sector or wave, and you've got warm temperatures, then the temperature changes, the weather changes, you get into the cold air, and generally those patterns of weather last for four to six weeks. Now that's significant because just the other day you had uh, Puxitani Phil, the weather forecaster, right, the groundhog, that's based upon people's awareness that the weather patterns shift on approximately five to six week cycle. Okay, so, so uh, and it's based upon these waves in the jet stream that migrate from west to east. But the waves are not the same amplitude in a north-south pattern all the time. They get much higher or deeper. So you get warm air pushing well north, and you get cold air pushing very far south, that occurs as the Earth is cooling down, which is precisely what's been going on for the last eight to ten years. So as that polar front is pushing further and further south, you get these extremes of weather that are warm in one area and cold in another. And you, you look at what makes Arizona last night, whether it was minus three Celsius or something, you see this cold air pushing well south. That's been going on in the southern hemisphere. They've, they've had frost as far as southern Brazil over the last several year, uh, uh, winters. And, and so, of course, the global warming advocates are saying, oh, no, this is because of warming. In fact, they're 100% wrong. It's because of cooling. But it's because they don't understand these general mechanisms that create the climatic patterns that, that go on all the time. Is it true that our jet stream is changing? It changes all the time. It, it, uh, it increases in speed. Uh, it varies in speed around the, around the globe. And as I said, this pattern of it uh, changes. Not to get deeper in, although we yeah, may no, be no. deeper in, but is it influenced by our magnetic field? Yes. Yes, and, and of course, one of the things people talk about is how the moon comes up and we get, you know, full moons, we get different weather patterns. Right. The moon influences our, our magnetic field. And that's the relationship. Does the and, sun? And pe people that are making accurate forecasts, not only on a four to five day basis, but on a three to four month basis, um, is a guy by the name of Piers Corbin, an Englishman. And he's got a... a, a AccuWeather, right? Yeah, weather action. and, and he's or Weather making, action. Yeah, he's been making very accurate forecasts, and what he's doing is he's using changes in the solar output, which cause changes in the magnetic field of the Earth, and, and as as is the basis of his forecasts. 
I cannot imagine anybody not considering the impact of the sun and the sun on the magnetic field here in terms of looking at climate. I can't even imagine that that would be omitted from the equation of looking at climate. Okay, well, let's loop that back in because, you see, the, the reason that the weather has become such a big issue is because of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, okay? And their reports about, oh, we're warming and it's definitely going to keep warming. The fact they've been wrong with every forecast they've made is, 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 is uh, forgotten in the hysteria. But what people don't realize is that their definition of climate change, given to them by the United Nations, by uh, the um, United Nations uh, Federal or Commission on, on Climate Change, was they only look at climate changes caused by humans. They don't look at natural causes of climate change. You mean cyclical? Oh, any of them. They don't look at the sun. They don't look at the, the cycles of the ocean. They don't look at, they, they don't even look at water vapor. I thought which it was is the fascinating. Most important greenhouse gas. I thought it was fascinating that most of the greenhouse gases are water vapor. What's yep. the percentage? Do you know? 95% by volume. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yes, but, yeah, so, what they've done is they've defined their role is to look at climate change as ca the, the, the human causes of climate change, which, and of course, what I keep pointing out to people is you can't possibly determine what portion of climate change is human if you don't know how it changes naturally. But that's what they're doing. And uh, so, and by the way, just back to the Arctic ice, can we, can we flip yes. back to that for yes. a second Let's just to it. illustrate the point here? Yes, please. Every single winter, the Arctic uh, freezes over and surrounding oceans uh, Hudson Bay, for example, and um, uh, out into the Bering Straits, and approximately 15 million square kilometers of ice forms every winter. But every summer, about 10 million square kilometers of that ice melts. So about two-thirds melts every single summer. Now, 10 million square kilometers of ice is an area equal to the continental U.S., most people don't even know that. I don't. I'm not sure the listeners know that either. No. So you've got Some 10 million square kilometers of ice melting every single summer. But here's the most remarkable thing. That 10 million square kilometers melts in about 140 days. That means it's melting at the rate of 66,000 square kilometers of ice a day. Wow. And that is equal to half the size of the state of Illinois every single day. Okay, and now now let's do that. Let's play the sensational game, because a couple of years ago they came out. And they, <laughs> okay, because a couple You're of years. You're making me laugh. Go ahead. Let's play the sensational game. Yeah, a couple of years ago they came out and said, "Oh, more ice melted this summer than last year, an area the size of Texas." Okay, why did they use Texas? Oh, it's big in people's minds. That's a huge area. But in fact, Texas as an area, as a percentage of the 10 million square kilometers, is only about 4%. So that 4%, of course, is within the natural fluctuation of the amount of ice from year to year that melts. So it's actually well within normal variability, but because of the way they presented the story and because they know people don't know that 10 million square kilometers melts every single summer, um, that, that they can get away with this stuff. And, of course, then they say the polar bears, uh, you know, they're drowning and, and uh, Gore had that movie. And the woman that took that picture, by the way, of the polar bears up on that chunk of ice, um, she came out and said, look, we, we were on a cruise up there. And we watched the polar bears. They swam over and got up on the ice to get a better view of us. <laughs> and, and another interesting part of this, just to illustrate to Kim, lack of understanding, and I, I mentioned working with the polar bear people, polar bears only evolved from Alaskan brown bears about 100,000 years ago, which is relatively recent. Um, they adapted to a white coat. To, in order to hide from their prey, which is mostly seal, they are superb swimmers. I have seen them 80, 90 miles offshore swimming away in the open ocean. The reason that they're good swimmers is because of the way that their fur is structured. The polar bear needs two types of furs. It needs um, a short fur, which is very dense, 
And to illustrate how dense, when I was working at Churchill, there was a scientist there wanted to count the number of polar bears. And he said, look, I'll, I'll just go up in an airplane with an infrared camera, and I'll take pictures of them, and wherever they are, the heat will show, and I'll count the, the, the heat spots, and that'll tell me how many polar bears are. He found out that they took an infrared picture of the polar bear, and, and it didn't show up, because the polar bear retained so much of its body heat, none was escaping through that fur. Fascinating. That's remarkable, okay? And, and, uh, and, of course, the polar bear literally controls its body temperature through its anus. Now the, That's definitely has, a TMI type of content. Yes. <laughs> you know, I did a piece with Mitch Taylor, but he didn't yeah. mention that. That was no. interesting. Well, uh, it, well, I guess he, Mitch didn't want to be as indelicate as I am <laughs> in your program. I, I feel that I'm more familiar with you than Mitch. Uh, let me let you finish, and then I wanted to ask you about methane. And yeah, I want to okay. talk to you about permafrost, but please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Now, the other fur that the polar bear has is the long fur, which is hollow. And, of course, the polar bear needs to get sunlight into it. It's got two things going against it. One, it's got this very dense fur, but it's also white. And, of course, white means you reflect a lot of the sunlight. The polar bear, for its climate, should be black. But if it was black, it wouldn't be able to sneak up on its prey. And, uh, of course, its prey is white because it's trying to hide in, into the, the snow background. So this fur that the polar bear has is hollow. The sunlight hits it, is transmitted down inside the fur into the body to raise the body temperature. Now, if you've got fur that is hollow and long like that, it means that you can float. And if you do, next time you look at polar bear swimming, you'll see how all this long fur is up all around it floating on the top of the water. And the polar bear just simply paddles away with its great big paws, which are wide and flat so that it, it's like a snowshoe, but that works wonderfully well as a paddle in the water. Have you ever met one? Oh, yes. How close were you? Oh, within about 20 feet. And how was it for you? Uh, frightening. <laughs> Were you if, in a boat, or be, where were you? We were on searches out of Churchill, and, and uh, we went out into the town of Churchill. And, of course, they, what they do is they wait along the shore of the Hudson Bay, waiting for the ice to form. And, and you have to be very careful um, because, uh, you know, the, the boulders and, and so on. And you can't tell what's a polar bear and, and what's a boulder. I think at some point you would find out. Yeah, oh yeah, you would. You, they, you, you get uh, surprised. Well, and, and of course they have po polar bear patrols, I mean, for the kids going to school and so on. And um, we, we just happened to uh, surprise this one. And fortunately, he was more surprised than we were. Thank God. T took off the other way. Now, this was during your search and rescue days. Search and rescue t t time, yeah. Tell us briefly about your search and rescue. What did you do? I was a, a, a navigator and electronics officer and flying with the Canadian Air Force. And we were based in Winnipeg, but all of our search area was into the, um, well, the, the prairies and then the Yukon Northwest Territories right to the North Pole. But most of our searches were uh, in the wintertime in the Arctic. And, um, and, of course, one of the things that every nation has to do as part of their UN agreement is provide search and rescue. And so I was on some, and this was long before GPS was available. Uh, and one of the things that, again, that people don't realize is you reach a certain point in Canada where there's a line on the map which says your, your compass is unreliable beyond this point. And um, so people were constantly getting lost. The other thing is uh, in the wintertime, once you get north of the tree line, the lakes are frozen. The snow covers everything. You can't even identify lakes. So it's very easy to get lost. And um, so uh, I was involved in a lot of the major searches uh, in the early days in, in the Arctic and the Yukon. And uh, it was one of the things that uh, got me really excited about uh, this planet and how incredible it is. Um, I mean, for example, Baffin Island and, and the fjords there, they make Norway look like a flatland. It's just an unbelievable experience. Only two things I regret. One is I didn't take enough photographs, and the other is I didn't buy enough Eskimo carvings before they got too expensive. <laughs> but I did buy some. And, and by the way, I got to know the Inuit people, or as Canada calls them, incredible people, absolutely incredible people. Why do most... How they survive in that environment is just amazing. Well, how do they survive? Well, they... The, the, 
they do what we've got to do. You don't fight nature. You go with the flow. You go with what, what uh, nature will allow you to do. And, um, and uh, you know that, uh, as most people know, that uh, nature can kill you. Um, she's she's pretty harsh uh, uh, mistress, and um, so they they their uh, technology and adaptability of things. I had a friend who was a radio officer in in, in uh, an Eskimo village as it was then, and he had a radio. And um, one of them came in one day, was looking at it, took the radio apart and put it back together again. He'd never seen a radio in his life. Their technical skills are absolutely incredible. And, um, you know, Ron said to him, well, you know, how could you do that? And he said, well, you know, he said, if, if we need, if we needed it, we could build a radio, but we don't have a need for it. <laughs> My dad was a radio officer in the war when he was stationed in Paris. Yeah. Long time back. Yeah. Well, as I said, the, the Inuit people, um, they're, they, uh, they just, they could take anything and turn it into something useful. I mean, look at the kayak as the most incredible, uh, uh, vehicle uh, ship that you could imagine and sailing in incredibly dangerous waters and by the way when we talk about past weather and in the period from about 60 1690 to 1730 about a 40 year span there are at least six reports of eskimos in kayak showing up on the coast of scotland interesting can i bring you back to something about greenland yes okay yeah. is the greenland ice sheet breaking or melting or neither what's the bottom line on greenland because a lot of the imagery we see yeah. the is answer is all of the above um greenland of, of course is is a um it's left over from the last ice age and um one of the things uh, first of all the ice the bottom of the of uh, the ice is below sea level if the greenland ice cap was to melt completely you'd simply be left with a string of islands around the outside because the weight of the ice pushes the land down. And the same is true of Antarctica. You drill down in the Antarctic ice, by the time you get to the bottom, you're, you're several thousand feet below sea level. And, um, but the Greenland ice cap, of course, when they get to a certain size, these ice caps uh, create their own climate and can maintain themselves. Um, and one of the things that anybody that's uh, been around the edges of these very large glaciers, Antarctica or Greenland, the winds are very, very strong. I mean, there's a, there's a place in Cape Denison in the Antarctic where the average wind speed is about 55 miles an hour. Wow. And, and the reason for that is it's the cold air draining off of the glacier. And, of course, it drains down uh, off the dome of the glacier out to the oceans all around. And uh, it's called catabatic flow. It's a lovely word. Um, and um, people that uh, you talk to anybody that's flown into Thule, Greenland, for example, the American military base there, you, you can experience incredibly strong winds. And quite often they have to close the uh, airport there because of it. And so the glacier itself creates its own climate by this drainage. Um, generally, snowfalls over the glacier are quite low because they are high pressure because of the cold air, high pressure areas. And um, both the Antarctic and the Arctic, the, the South Pole and North Pole, are what we call in climate terms cold deserts. Um, that is that the, the, the amount of precipitation annually is extremely low. The North Pole, for example, is about two millimeters a year, which is, uh, you know, barely, fractions of an inch of, of precipitation. But it looks like there's lots because the snow falls and doesn't melt. And, uh, but the, the Greenland ice cap then has, has its own uh, climate pattern. It is, of course, as with all glaciers, it, it, it's, it, it's actually because it's in the line of the, of the Gulf Stream and the, the warm air flowing in, it gets more snowfall than, than our Antarctica or the North Pole, but uh, still relatively low. But you've got snowfall falling, and of course the amount of snow falling determines the dynamics of the glacier as much and in most times more than the temperature. So the interior of Greenland is getting snowfall. That's accumulating, pushing down. And as it pushes down, the plastic ice flows out to the around the edges of the glacier. And where that floats out into the oceans, particularly along uh, fjords, um, that's where you get the icebergs calving off. 
Um, the same thing happens around Antarctica. The ice pushes out into the ocean. Ice floats because it's a lower uh, specific gravity than the water. And, uh, and of course, with the tides and the waves and the action, they break off. And, of course, the one that everybody knows about is the, uh, the iceberg that uh, sunk the Titanic. And um, so what's happening is you can take any part of Greenland and you can show uh, one area where the, the uh, ice is uh, melting more rapidly than another um, because there are the, the regional climates and different parts of it, different things are going on. It's a very large uh, body of ice. Right now, um, uh, all the evidence is that the Greenland ice cap is, is getting larger and the increase of, of glaciers off of it is a measure of that. They're not a measure of, of melting. They're a measure of a growing ice cap. And we had the same thing up on Baffin Island about uh, three or four years ago when a large shelf of ice broke off and everybody said, oh, this is um, you know, warming. No, it wasn't. It was because uh, in, increased snowfall on Baffin Island had caused the mass of ice to increase. Can you imagine how many people don't know what to accept? Oh, I know. And not even how to think about this? Yeah. You know, Kim, I taught a course called, um, uh, it, it was actually a, a, a science credit for art students, and I just called it The Way the Earth Works. And I said, you know, as citizens of Earth, you need to know how your planet functions, because if you don't, you can be exploited. People can come along and tell you this is going on and that's going on, and you won't know. It's the same way that I argued in any curriculum. There should be at least an hour on how to roof a house because everybody's going to have to roof a house sooner or later. Now, they're not going to have to do it, but if they don't know how it's done, then some unscrupulous tradesman can come along and take advantage of them. And, and that's what our education, where it's failing us so badly, is it's not teaching people to be students of Earth and citizens of Earth. And, um, we're, and, it, and this is made worse, by the way, Kim, because um, most students, 80%, are not scientists, in fact, are afraid of science and are almost proud of that. And you see that in, in law schools. Almost all the lawyers are art students, not science students, yet they're more and more every day confronted with scientific issues about solar collectors and pollution and all these other things. Uh, they're not prepared to deal with it. I agree with you. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this other piece here that came from the AP as the source yeah. that was reported in this online emergency and disaster information services for Budapest, Hungary. And it says, leaking Siberian ice prompts methane warning. As Siberia's thawing permafrost leaks methane, some scientists are warning of another emerging climate threat. I don't want to take us off track in terms of what the focus was, but what are they talking about? No, it, it doesn't take us off track okay. uh, at all. Um, now, now, I'll take you off track initially as a lead into this. Methane became an issue because it's one of the greenhouse gases. Okay. What percentage of it is in the greenhouse gas, is it? About 0.009%. Okay. It's fractional. But it became an issue because it served two purposes. It served a purpose as a greenhouse gas. But it also served a purpose for the animal rights people and the anti-beef brigade. Okay, and Jeremy Rifkin, and I, I hate to give him any credit or mention his name even, but he wrote a book called um, After Beef, and he blamed the cow for all of the problems of Western civilization. Uh, incredible thing. Wow. And, 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 of course, they were saying that the cows are producing methane, and that's causing global warming. And um, a lot of the farmers, I worked as a technical advisor for the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, and, and they were genuinely concerned. They said, is, is this a real problem? And do we need to worry about it? What's going on here? And then Rifkin came out with his book. Now, you notice you haven't heard much about the methane lately until this kind of article. This came out November 23rd, 2010. Yeah, well, they're doing that because CO2 is starting to lose its luster. People are starting to realize it's not the cause. So the, you flip back to the methane one. Well, I say, well, if, if that doesn't work, well, we'll go back to this here. And um, <laughs> so the methane issue has come back into the news because the CO2 um, uh, arguments and the, you know, the, the email leaks and all the rest of it. Plus, of course, the reason they changed from global warming to climate change was because CO2 is going up and the global temperatures are going down. And uh, so they've got a problem there. But the methane issue, as I said, that's where it started originally. But, of course, then people saw it as more in terms of 
oh, it's a greenhouse gas and therefore we've got to reduce it. New Zealand even uh, planned to introduce, and they're still working on it, a tax on animals that produce methane. And, of course, the, you know, were you going to include humans in that, I guess? I don't know. I would imagine we're made of carbon dioxide, too. Yeah. Can you explain something else to us, create a context for us? Permafrost, I, I get a yeah. lot of emails saying there's permafrost thawing all over the world. <laughs> of course there I is. mean, it's NBC, <laughs> CBS. Yeah, permafrost, and, and, it, and it's a fascinating stuff. Um, it's uh, it, it means permanently frozen ground, but the ground isn't frozen. It's the water in the ground that's frozen, all right? And you've got um, basically two kinds of permafrost. You've got permanent permafrost. That is, the ground is frozen. If you thaw it out, it will refreeze. You've also got what is called uh, temporary or relic permafrost. That is permafrost left over from the last ice age. So, for example, when I talked about that ice sheet that covered one-third of North America, the ground became frozen underneath that as permafrost. But as the glacier has retreated in, in, in northern, or central and northern Canada, now it's been gone for about 8,000 years, um, the permafrost line has been retreating all of that time. But there are still some areas, uh, if your listeners want to go and look at a map of Manitoba, there's a town called Thompson, and this is a measure of how uh, our geography minds are wrong. They talk about Thompson as being northern Manitoba. In fact, it's right in the center of, of Manitoba. There are building lots in the city of Thompson where the council rule that you cannot build on it unless you build it on stilt, your house on stilts, or you get steam heat in and thaw out the permafrost that's still there. Why? Okay. Well, because the soil is a very, very poor conductor of heat. And so it, it, it's, um, if you put some ice out and, and cover it with dirt, uh, a, a certain depth of dirt, that ice will remain uh, uh, frozen for a very long time. And so this ground that was frozen, you know, during the last ice age is still not thawed out yet. But of course, as the world warms up, gradually the heat gets down into the ground and it thaws it out. Now, in the area of the permanent permafrost, every summer, the ground that's exposed, the upper layer of it will thaw out. That's called the active layer. And it can vary in depth. Um, and, and it can be a problem, by the way, the permafrost. Just to give you a quick little story, um, uh, when, when Franklin and his expedition, uh, di they died up there, um, I mean, they spent hours and days trying to dig a, a grave to give a proper Christian burial, and they couldn't do it. And uh, the town of Churchill, uh, what they would do is in the summer, they would dig the graves they needed for the coming winter. They'd estimate how many people were going to die. And, um, and of course, then when the local, um, uh, the, es the Eskimos or Inuits, as we call them, and the Dene people, the Aboriginal people, said, hey, you know, you're tempting fate. That's, that's not a good thing to do. And um, so what they do now is they've got a, a special device that they sit over the area where they want the grave, and they thaw out the ground with a lot of heat. And so they only thaw out the graves that they need. But once the, once the, person is put into that permafrost grave, they remain, uh, they don't uh, decay, they're frozen. And one of the situations I got involved with, 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 with a Dr. Ewart was that there were people buried at York Factory on H Hudson Bay in this permafrost, and in the cemetery at York Factory, 80% of them had died of smallpox. And what Dr. Ewart was afraid of was that the government were planning to clear the bush uh, and the the willow scrub, and that would have allowed the ground to thaw out. And he was afraid that this smallpox, which had supposedly been eradicated on a world basis, would become active and, and live again. And uh, as I said, the bodies are intact. And um, you can read about those um, uh, the uh, Franklin ex expedition, the bodies that were exposed. Um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Owen Geiger. The author, I'm trying to think of his name. He wrote a book about it, Frozen, Frozen in Time. 
okay. uh, about these bodies frozen permanently in the ice. And of course, they're marvelous for science to learn about. And it's from those bodies, by the way, they found that the Franklin expedition died of lead poisoning because they could test the lead flash. But anyway, so that the, the active layer thaws out, that's of course one of the things that makes any development in the north problematic because here you've got water, ground earth that's thawed out, very, very saturated because it was frozen in the winter time, and it's sitting on a layer of ice. And so you get this land uh, moving or flowing, and it creates incredible landscapes and features. Uh, it's a process called solifluxion. And of course, soli is soil, and fluxion is flow. And you get these features uh, of, of stones being sorted into to, uh, geometric patterns and stripes down the sides of hillsides. And, and the early explorers thought that these were simply uh, d done by the local people. But in fact, they're part of the natural landscape of a permafrost region and this active layer that thaws out every summer. I just saw the book, by the way. It's called Frozen in Time, The Fate of the Franklin Expedition, Owen yeah. Beatty and John yeah. Geiger. Yeah, and I, I hate to mention that because um, I gave them all the, the, the uh, what the weather was like for that uh, period of time when Franklin was in that region. If you look in the book, you'll find me referenced in there. But anyway... Um, so, uh, and, and Dr. Ewart, by the way, uh, the book that we did on the uh, naturalists of Hudson Bay, 18th century naturalists of Hudson Bay, we dedicated our book to Dr. Ewart because, sadly, before he could retire and work full-time at, at the uh, medical records of the Hudson Bay Company archives, he passed away. But uh, his work on, on the uh, smallpox in those graves was, was very important uh, work. But anyway, this, this, um, these uh, permafrost then, the, what happens is that when it thaws out, of course, it beca it's, very, it's very saturated. It becomes swampland. Now, they call it in, in the Arctic region, it's muskeg. And, of course, it's, it's, uh, it, there's certain uh, vegetation that grows on, in it. Um, the major one is sphagnum moss. Sphagnum moss, of course, is very important for the uh, people, the the, the uh, indigenous people of the area. It it is it can hold 18 times its own weight in water, um, but of course it fills in a, a it gradually grows into swampy areas and it looks like a solid surface. But the minute you step on it, you're, you're going to disappear out of sight. And you go and read the stories of of the American uh, Army trying to build the Alaska Highway back in the war, and whole bulldozers just sinking out of sight into this, into these uh, muskeg swamp areas. But here's my question about the thawing permafrost. Well, as it thaws out, of course, the, the, the methane from it is released into the atmosphere. That's what they're arguing, and they're arguing that with global warming, this will increase, and since methane's a greenhouse gas, it, it's going to cause this problem. Got it. So that's what that's about. Yes. But how come the permafrost thaws out. What could be making it thaw out? Well, it's not thawing out. Uh, remember I mentioned earlier about going up the side of the mountain or going up the si uh, up in latitude? Yes. And you reach a point of the permanent snow line, and, and, um, and of course, beyond that, um, the snow doesn't melt in the summertime and the permafrost doesn't melt in the summertime. And, and so what they're arguing is that as the world warms up, that line of permanent snow line is retreating up the sides of the mountains, which, of course, then has effect on the glaciers, but it also has effect on the permafrost. And, and um, what I'm telling you is that the permafrost has been thawing out for the last uh, 12,000, 15,000 years since the glaciers uh, started to retreat. And uh, so what's going on is perfectly natural. And by the way, Kim, one other thing, one of the reasons you haven't heard much about methane is because uh, people like me and others were pointing out that the atmospheric level of methane, by their own measures, has decreased over the last 15 years, not increased. And there's another interesting part of this. When they started the methane story, and the permafrost was one of the early ones, and it's come back again, um, they started out by saying, oh, oh there was more termites. And there were more termites because of agriculture in Africa and clearing of the forest and so on. Then, it, then they discovered that the scientists had miscalculated by a factor of four, so the termites were off the list. Then, they, then somebody said, well, it's because we're not trapping the beaver, and there's more beaver ponds and more muskeg and swamps, and therefore uh, more methane being produced. And then that was shown to be false. 
And um, but one of the things that was never mentioned, uh, they point they pointed the finger at the number of cattle, and there's no question cattle produce uh, methane at both ends. In fact, they produce more methane from chewing the cud than they do from the other end, and um, uh, the they, that's only one half of the formula. Because in the last 120 years in North America, we've gone from about 120,000 cows to to about 86 million. So no question, cows produce methane, there's an increase. But on the other side of the formula that never got mentioned was we've regrettably gone from about 65 million bison down to about 120,000, sorry, 120,000 bison. Now that that is regrettable. How did that happen? Different issue. How did that happen? Well, it it happened because of um, a couple of things. One one is that um, the um, uh, the spread of agriculture, uh, fencing in the, in the land, but also the main thing was, of course, the the providing of guns. And um, you mean the bison was hunted down to that number? Oh yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Yeah, and and of course uh, one of one of the things that that people thought well the white men brought the gun, but actually most of the hunting uh, for the white men was done by by the native peoples. So of course they, they were with the guns they were just ten times more efficient. It's the same as as at Churchill they they uh, shot geese every spring because the geese became their major food supply the following winter. They would salt them down in barrels. Well, the average um, Indian could shoot. To, five, six, seven times as many geese as, as the average European could. So they simply hired them to do the job for them. What is your biggest concern about climate, even if it's cyclical? Is your concern the cooling? Talk a couple of minutes about that, and then I want to invite you back to talk about a few other subjects. Yeah, well, the, the, the cooling, uh, when you look at history, uh, plants and animals, uh, which of course inc- includes humans, generally uh, grow and proliferate and benefit from warmer uh, temperatures. And um, the, uh, when things get cold, uh, you, you get uh, all sorts of uh, difficulties developing. Uh, not only, and, and by the way, most of the major advances in human history are uh, trying to deal with cold. I mean, the discovery of fire, for example, uh, was was uh, a micro creating a microclimate to let you live in areas you wouldn't normally be able to live. Clothing was another factor because um, the early people were living up right up up at, uh, close to the edge of the ice. I did a work with a, a, a professor Micklejohn, an anthropologist who was working in Europe, uh, and he wanted he was trying to figure out how close to the ice these people were living, and they were living right at the ice front uh, because that's where the great herds of animals were being pushed. And that was their food supply, and so the cooling um, it, it is really, really devastating. It reduces the amount of available land for agriculture, um, and quite significantly, it reduces the variety of crops that you can grow. Uh, for example, back in the 1970s, um, because the world was cooling down, the uh, United Nations commissioned uh, in, uh, research into the impact of cooling. Uh, the coming cooling trend. And the CIA did, uh, uh, to my knowledge, at least three reports on the impact of cooling, how it would um, uh, reduce food supply, cause social unrest, and that the governments better be ready for this. And um, so the biggest problem now is we're heading for that kind of cooling, but we're preparing for warming. Isn't that frightening? That's what I said a year and a half ago when I first started learning all this. Most of the populations are preparing for the wrong cycle. Right. And and the thing is that you, you could actually, you can't be in a win-win situation. You never can. I mean, every time there's change, there's winners and losers. It's just that you want to reduce the amount of loss as much as you can. But I've argued uh, before the Canadian government and the American government when I was in Washington, if you prepare for cooling and it warms, that adaptation is much, much easier than to prepare for warming and then it cools. And uh, if you look, say, for example, and we'll take Canada or the northern U.S., if Canada cools by one and a half degrees Celsius on its annual average temperature, we're effectively out of agriculture. That's frightening. 
Right. And, and also, of course, the northern states of the U.S. I mean, you think about North Dakota and, and all through there. If you get them preparing for, uh, for cooling uh, and it warms, and, and nobody's farming north of Canada, right? But there are people farming south of Canada and the, and the U.S. And so the adaptation is that much easier. And um, so uh, it, it's a bit like Pascal's um, uh, theory, isn't it? That um, they said, do you believe in God? And he said, of course. And they said, well, you're a rationalist. You're not supposed to believe in God. And he said, well, I figure if I believe in God and there isn't one, I haven't lost anything. But if, <laughs> if I don't, if I don't believe in God and there is one, I'm in a lot of trouble. <laughs> All right. So it's logical that we should prepare for cooling because we can adapt to, to warming. I, I like to tease some of the extreme environmentalists. They say, look, uh, you know, we're preparing for warming and the cooling is coming on relatively quickly. Um, that the only hope to produce the, the type of seeds and, uh, that we need to adapt to that uh, genetic modification is the only answer. Well, of course, they don't want to hear that answer either. So are you saying you're for GMO seeds? Not, not necessarily. What I'm saying is that um, plant breeding is a very crude form of, of genetic modification. Got it. It, takes, it takes you about 15 years to get the kind of plant that you want with plant breeding. But with GM, GMO, you can do it in, in 18 months. And so it, 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 uh, it has dangers with it, but it, it's a much more rapid response. I'm one of those people after my investigations into genetically modified food and the organizations that are involved in this, that file patents on the molecular structure of seeds, that file patents on animals, I can leave it. But I think getting hybrid seeds and being able to deal with cold environments, yeah. we have to be thinking about it. It, it's not necessarily the technique, it's the people that uh, use and misuse it. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think when people start splicing DNA and altering genetics, I think that what ends up happening is they start to think they're God and start to do things that cross the line of appropriateness. And the thing is that a lot of these organizations are never going to be able to be monitored. No, and, and of course, that's another part of the, the thing we've been, you and I have been discussing all yes. along, because science in effect, through Darwin, got rid of God, which then, of course, they replace him. They are now the gods. And, <laughs> the, and the religion is, the, is environmentalism because the young people need a moral uh, belief, and, and environmentalism provides them with that. So, yeah, th that, that's part of this whole debate. I really appreciate you being our guest. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, listening to, and learning from Dr. Tim Ball. He's a climatologist. He's been teaching for 40 years. He has thousands of articles, and very soon you'll be able to go to his new website, drtimball.com. Thank you so much. Thank you.